Welcome to worship at the United Church Winchester. It's wonderful to share in this time of praise and worship with you once again. Wherever you are, whether we know you or whether uh, you're joining us anonymously via the uh, mysteries and magic of the web, you are most welcome. We join together as one people, the body of Christ. Uh, just one announcement. You, you have um, hopefully spotlight um, either in paper form or uh, online, and most of the notices for this week are in there. But one that I just wanted to highlight was a new house group which I'm going to be leading on alternate Tuesdays, uh, starting from not, not this coming Tuesday, the following Tuesday. And that's going to be um, as part of our um, new discipleship series, uh, which we're going to be reflecting on in our services, but also as part of our house groups. So the session that normally is on Tuesday at 2 for Going Deeper will alternate between uh, a Going Deeper session as we've been doing and a house group session. But I promise that it will, will still aim to keep it at 45 minutes um, for that house group session, uh, definitely no longer than an hour. So I want to say particularly if you're not in a house group at the moment, um, I, I'd encourage you to really consider getting in touch with myself or with Julie or with Tim Clifford, somebody in the FWE team um, to say, yeah, I'm interested in joining a uh, house group. And uh, if, if that one on Tuesday meets your needs, then I'd be very, very happy to see you. But there are other house groups that are meeting at the moment as well. Today, our theme is Discipleship Begins With Us. And you may have noted in Spotlight that I said, if you, if you want to, bring an item that is symbolic to you of your walk with Jesus. Perhaps it's something that uh, somebody wrote to you in a card or something that was given to you, a gift. Uh, perhaps it was something that you've collected from nature. It could be anything, just something that's symbolic to you because we're going to be thinking a little bit about uh, our role in discipleship and discipleship beginning with us. And I want to take a point in the service to just give thanks to all of those who have discipled us throughout the years. So have that to hand uh, and, and, and that will be after our opening prayers. Our service will begin in a few moments, so let us keep silence as we calm our minds and focus on God's unfailing presence with us all, wherever we are. call to worship and I invite you to join in the responses that will appear on screen. Jesus said, those who would come after me must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. Lead us, Lord Jesus, help us to follow you. You denied yourself Help us to follow you. You took up the cross. Help us to follow you. And so we join in song with our first hymn. It's number 28. If you're following in the hymn books, Jesus calls us here to meet him. And we will be excluding verse 4. Jesus calls us here to meet him. Thank you.
our prayer of approach. Let us pray. Gracious God, Lord of all, we thank you that we can come to you in prayer, that for all your greatness and wonder and holiness, we can speak with you as to a friend. We thank you that we can open our hearts to you, that we can pour out our innermost souls and share our deepest thoughts in the knowledge that you are there, always ready to listen and understand. So now, once more, we lay our lives before you, open to your gaze, the bad as well as the good, the doubt as well as the faith, the sorrow as well as the joy, the despair as well as the hope. We bring the anger as well as the peace, the hatred as well as the love, the confusion as well as the certainty, the fear as well as the trust. Gracious God, we bring these not with pride or any sense of arrogance, but honestly, recognising that you know us through and through. Help us to be truthful to ourselves and truthful to you. And so may we discover the renewing love which only you can offer, a love that frees us to live as you would have us live and allows us to, the, to be the people you would have us be. So in silence, let us confess our sins before you and seek your forgiveness. a prayer of confession, and I invite you to join in with the responses that will appear on screen. When we find it easier to walk the way of the world and not the way of the cross, forgive us, Lord, and set our minds on you. When we place self before others, and seek reassurance in our own importance. Forgive us, Lord, and set our minds on you. When we turn our backs on God because we fear the consequences of looking to the future and our vision is narrowed by what we think we might achieve. Forgive us, Lord, and set our minds on you. When we give up our lives for the sake of a comfortable existence, forgive us, Lord, and set our minds on you. When the cross is rough and heavy, and our shoulders ache, and we feel unable to carry on. Forgive us, Lord, and set our minds on you. Amen. Gracious God, help us to translate our thoughts into actions, to put our preaching into practice, to turn our good intentions into good deeds. Help us to learn from Jesus, who laid down his life for others, and in growing closer to him, may our lives speak not of ourselves, but of you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
Amen. So if you have brought something to worship, uh, some kind of symbol of something or someone who has helped you on your Christian walk, who has, in effect, helped you in your discipleship, then now is the time to hold that in your hands or have it close to you, however that's appropriate for you to do so. And I stand here hanging my head in shame because the book that I was going to bring is still on the bookshelf at home. Um, so I'll have to describe it to you um, because I'm going to share mine with you before we pray for these symbols and people and things that have inspired us in our faith. And maybe if you do want to join us for fellowship time after the service, if you're feeling bold, perhaps you m might like to share uh, your particular uh, reflection or, or symbol uh, with the others um, and, uh, and, and, and kind of just share what has inspired you about that in your walk of faith. Now, what I was going to bring with me was the Oxford Bible Commentary. It's a one-volume Bible commentary, um, and I'm going to hold it there as though I'm holding the real thing, because it's quite a big book, weighty book, and it's, uh, it's well, it's, it's was pu published within the last 15 years, 15, 20 years, so it's a fairly new commentary, uh, one-volume commentary as, as commentaries stand. I'm waffling now, aren't I? Um, but basically, the, the long and the short of it, of, of that is that it was co-edited by my New Testament tutor, the Reverend Dr. John Muddyman, who sadly I, I learnt recently died just before Christmas uh, 2020. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pretend that I've put the book down now because it's quite heavy, you see. Um, and it's a, a, a wonderful volume uh, and it's, it's an undergraduate's favourite really because it's a go-to point if you're going to start anywhere. It's a good place to start with lots of different kind of critical analysis and scholarly opinions. But whenever I pick up that, book, that commentary, as I often do when I'm preparing for a service, I remember him because I think of all of the tutors that I had during my uh, ministerial formation he was the one who I always looked forward to going to my tutorial sessions with, and so did the other ordinands as well. He was uh, the, the GB Cared Fellow um, at Mansfield College, and uh, it was just a joy sometimes to sit in his study, and we would read through some of the work that we'd been doing, and he would open up different perspectives. And sometimes if you just got him started, you could just sit and listen, and it was as if you were kneeling at the, uh, at the uh, feet of somebody that could just lead you through with such care and, uh, and such warmth and uh, his affable nature. And it, he really did inspire me. Uh, and there, there are a few notable figures in my journey, but he's the one on my mind at the moment. He really did inspire me to dig deeper to go deeper in my faith, to, to scratch beneath the surface, to wrestle with scripture, not to just accept one perspective or another perspective, and to think about the wide uh, range of things that, uh, that we have to when we're interpreting scripture together. So if I had it, that would be the thing that I was holding, that I hold on to, uh, would be that one volume commentary, and it's often with me, and that's just as a nod to John Muddyman, my uh, New Testament tutor, um, who I remember now. And so that's who I've thought about. It might not be a person for you. It might be a. Um, it might be something you were given, or something from nature. Whatever it is, we're going to just take a moment now to be quiet. To perhaps, if it's um, if it's uh, suitable, appropriate to do so, hold your symbol in your hands to think about what it means to us. And then after a few moments of silence, I'm going to say a short word of prayer. Gracious God, we lift to you all of these people all of these words and symbols that have inspired us and led us in our own faith journey. For each of these people on our minds, 
that revelation of your goodness and your grace will have started somewhere. And they had the generosity. And they were obedient to your will and shared that with us, being disciples themselves and making disciples of Christ. We thank you for all of the things in nature that inspire us. All of the moments we've, of mystery that we've had which show us something of you, which lead us further into your grace and love. And so today we thank you for all those who have inspired us in our faith journeys. And we recommit ourselves to be good stewards and disciples of your gracious word that we may know it, nourish it, and live it for ourselves, and that we may share that love and that grace with the world. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Ralph and Carol Jessup are going to read our readings for us this morning, firstly from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and then from the Gospel according to Mark chapter 9. We hear the word of God in Scripture. Two Corinthians chapter 4 verses 3 to 6. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. We do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Mark chapter 9, verses 2 to 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Let's pray together. Gracious God, open our hearts to your message once again, to your words of life. Help us to be good disciples, to look to you, to shape our lives by you and for you. May your Holy Spirit inspire our living in every way. Open our ears to hear your words. 
for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, would you believe it, but today is the last Sunday before Lent. How the weeks seem to go by so quickly. And as is always the case in the Christian year, this Sunday marks the transition from Epiphany, the season of Revelation, to Lent, the second season of preparation in the Christian year. The first of which is Advent, of course, which we know, which prepares us for the coming of Christ into the world, God with us, whereas Lent, that second season of pre preparation, prepares us for Jesus' death and resurrection. And so it's no coincidence that this Sunday's lectionary reading from the Gospel is always set to revisit the transfiguration of Jesus. It's the moment when Jesus' glory is revealed to, to the disciples, marking a step change in his ministry as he turns towards Jerusalem. But this year I don't want to preach on the transfiguration itself. Rather, I want to use it as a metaphor for where we are in our shared life as a church and as followers of Christ. I don't know about you, but I'm always struck by how reluctant Jesus is in Mark's Gospel for the disciples to tell others about his deeds and miracles. You would have thought, you know, from where we're standing, it's all about sharing, it's all about uh, proclaiming um, uh, the good things that God has done and who Jesus is. But there is that note of caution, and we hear it here too after the scenes of the transfiguration in verse 9. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. It's strange, um, and, and it happens elsewhere as well in the Gospels. It's like a hushed silence after a moment of immense power and majesty, as if, you know, they've seen all of these things, and probably they just want to share it. They want to tell somebody. And then Jesus explicitly says, no, don't say anything about this not until the right time. There's a wide array of opinions on why this is, but the interpretation I'm drawn to comes back to this word, preparation. The revelation of who Jesus really was and is was still dawning on the disciples. We might have the benefit of hindsight, but we must always remember that they did not. The story is happening there and then for them now as we read it, as it's being represented. It was still dawning on them. They were still in the process of making that quantum leap from prophet and teacher to saviour of the world. And that's a pretty big leap to take. We can stand here confidently with all of the, the, the scriptures before us with all of the commentaries that have been uh, written on those scriptures. But this revelation was still emerging to them. And this, like I said, a quantum leap from prophet and teacher to saviour of the world. Jesus was still preparing them. Possibly even was still coming to a moment of preparation in himself for, uh, for the Easter journey. Jesus was still preparing them, was still in the process of revealing his true nature to them. Revelation has to start somewhere. And it started with those first disciples as he's began over time through companionship with them, through walking alongside them to reveal something of his nature to them. So that re revelation began with the disciples and I have a feeling and I have a sense that the reason why Jesus said, no, don't, don't shout this out yet is because you're still being prepared. 
because I'm still making you into disciples, because you need to be fully formed disciples in order to make disciples yourselves. Jesus was still discipling them. And we, therefore, as disciples of Christ in this age and in this place, are equally being called by Christ to pause, I believe, to reflect, to prepare and to reacquaint ourselves with the revelation so that when the time is right, we too can reveal it to others with confidence and with conviction. Discipleship begins with us. I know when we think of discipling, we often think about sharing our faith, evangelizing might be another word, but I firmly believe that if we are to do that, if we are to make disciples of people, make disciples of Christ, then we ourselves must be in a right place as disciples of Jesus. Discipleship begins with us. We can't expect to make disciples of Christ unless we ourselves are ready to do so. That's why this year, starting next week on the first Sunday of Lent, we're making discipleship our focus. And I'm delighted to commend to you our new discipleship resource, which has been co-written by Julie Howard and Tim Clifford. It has three sections Know it, nourish it, live it. Know it, nourish it, live it. You're going to get very used to hearing those uh, three titles over the course of this year. Each of those sections contains four weeks of material to help us grow in our discipleship. Know it, the four sessions of Know It will start next Sunday, and I'm going to... uh, preach on alternate Sundays leading up to Easter Day on the themes of each week's of each week's material and then we're going to follow that up in our house groups and then later in the year beginning in May we're going to do nourish it and then starting in September we're going to do live it so what can I say about know it nourish it and live it well I don't want to give away too much of what we're going to be doing but I think the titles speak for themselves. Can we be disciples of Christ, effective disciples of Christ, if we don't know what that gospel is about, if we don't know what that message is about, if we don't know what being disciples of Christ is really about? And if we don't know for ourselves or perhaps have forgotten or set aside in our minds what was instrumental in bringing us to faith, what excited us about our faith, what still excites us about our faith. So knowing ourselves and knowing knowing our faith are right at the heart of that first section. And then secondly, moving on to nourish it. We might know something of our faith, We might know something of ourselves, we might know something of God, but if we don't nourish an understanding of that, then it falls away. So learning to nourish our faith, to see what it is that does nourish our faith. I'm thinking prayer and community with one another. And then finally to live it. Because if we're not living our discipleship, if we're not living it out, then how can we possibly hope to be an example to others of what the discipleship, of what the the love and the law of Christ brings to our lives? So we must learn to live out our discipleship. This is why I'm saying that discipleship begins with us. As a church, we're going going to focus on being better disciples of Christ so that we, in turn, can be disciples of Christ to all. Know it, nourish it, live it. Get used to hearing those titles. Why is this important? Well, I think that some of the words from 2 Corinthians 4 help us in this. 
starting in verse 3, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the mind of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as slaves for Jesus' sake. Now, I know that the language of perishing is quite unpopular. We don't like to think of people perishing. We don't like to think in terms of of people, I can remember the old term, and it used to make me shudder, it still does, backsliding. Oh, dear. But isn't it the case that our faith does begin to crumble and our faith does begin to perish when we don't prioritise it? when we don't place it, when we don't place love of God right at the very centre of our lives, there is a risk in in Christ becoming veiled to us when we do not nourish our faith, when we do not seek to be disciples ourselves, when we do not seek that way of life that is all about abiding in Christ. And so I want to challenge us all to reprioritize our faith over the coming year. Not just to see Sundays as the be-all and end-all, or even the house group meetings, though they're important, but to be thinking at every single stage and step of our day to be mindful of where God is in our thinking and how we're applying our faith to what we're doing, to our attitudes, how we are, how we speak, how we think, how we act. And this is where I feel as though it's a tremendous pot, kettle, black moment for me. Because yes, it's easy for me as, uh, you know, in my professional role as a minister to stand here and exhort uh, the, uh, the, the, the wisdom of being good disciples, of drawing closer to God and our faith. But I know, just like everyone else, that it's very hard to do at times in your own personal lives. And please, do not misunderstand me. I realise that sometimes life does get in the way. And it would be hypocritical of me to exhort you all to discipleship if I'm not prepared to do the same. And yes, very often I do Uh, use life as an excuse. I didn't get time to do it this time. That happened, which meant that that which I was hoping to do didn't. But I'm challenging myself to think about ways in the busy and frantic lives that we live can find a way of reconnecting with God or just acknowledging God in those moments. And that's just as important for me as it is for you, which is why I said I'm challenging us all together to a year of discipleship, a year of deepening our faith together. And this is where I want to come back to house groups because I think they are important. It is wonderful that we can meet together as church, even in our COVID-affected world, uh, for Sunday worship. But house groups do offer a chance for that deeper conversation. And more than that, they offer an opportunity for fellowship and pastoral support and and spiritual support. It's a separate sermon in a way, so I'm not going to get too bogged down in it now. But much of our origins as church began in houses. Houses, yeah, houses. They were a centre of, you know, as families, they were a centre of fellowship and learning. And in these COVID-affected times, small groups are, a, are absolutely key in helping us to stay connected with our faith and with each other at times when we can't 
congregate in the larger numbers that we'd like to in person. So I really want to encourage you um, as we begin this year of discipleship that if you're not in a house group, consider it. Think about it. And if that isn't right for you, think about what might be right. Maybe you've got that symbol that you're holding or that letter or that picture or that... Is there some way that you can put that in the forefront of your view, of your mind, so that we're encouraging ourselves, even if we need to take, even if we need at times just to take baby steps to call our minds back to the need for ongoing discipleship of ourselves as the people of God, to know it, to nourish it, and to live it. So think, challenge yourselves this week, realising that no one response is going to meet everybody's you know, life ex- experience and, and, and context. But think about what might be an appropriate response for you. Friends, Jesus calls us here to meet him. And then Jesus calls us to know him to be fed by him and then to share the love he brings into our lives with all. So let us gather around Jesus together. Amen. We come now to our prayers of of thanksgiving and intercession. Let us pray. Loving God, in all the changes and chances of our lives, all the many uncertainties we face, we thank you that you are a God we can depend on. Always good, always loving, always merciful and always faithful. We thank you for the assurance that whatever we may be confronted with, your love will go on reaching out, your hand go on supporting, and your purpose go on being fulfilled. Loving God, hear our prayers for all those in our world who seek to further your will here on earth. Those who work for peace, who campaign for justice, who strive to relieve poverty, who fight for the hungry. All those who struggle on behalf of the oppressed, the exploited, the underprivileged, and those denied their proper rights. prosper their efforts and grant them inspiration so that they may challenge people everywhere to give of themselves in the service of others. Loving God, hear our prayers for the church across the world, the body of Christ, We pray for the wisdom and inspiration of your Holy Spirit to help us all deepen our faith, deepen our trust in you, to deepen our desire to seek you out and to share your light with all. Help us in our discipleship and challenge us. Remind us that you do not seek to trip us up, but that you hold our hands, guiding us ever closer to you. Loving God, we bring before you the sick and suffering of our world. All those wrestling with illness in body, 
mind or spirit. We pray for those afflicted in body, enduring physical pain, overwhelmed by disabling disease, waiting for an operation or further treatment, and fearful of what the future may hold. We pray for those afflicted in spirit, those who feel their lives to be empty, those whose confidence has broken down, those unable to cope with the pressures of daily life, the lonely and all who are bereaved. In a moment of quiet, we lift particular people and situations known to us to God in our prayers. We pray for members of our own church community. In particular, remembering Margaret and John Axford. Continuing to hold them in our prayers, Margaret, for a speedy recovery. And John, that you will help him in all the support he gives her. And we pray also for Richard and Pauline giving thanks for their marriage and for all they bore witness to when they stood before you yesterday. We pray for them at the beginning of their married life together and ask that you grant them wisdom and peace in all that they may face together. Living God, speak to them as to us in your still small voice and grant them your peace, that peace which passes all understanding, the quiet confidence which only you can bring. And so may our burdens be lifted and our souls refreshed through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. with the words that Jesus taught us. Let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We sing our concluding hymn. It's number 564, if you're following in singing the faith. O thou who camest from above.
and now our blessing and I invite you to join in with the responses as they appear on screen. God of love and compassion, you meet us in the messiness of our lives. Stay with us now. God of love and compassion, you share our pain and heal our weaknesses. Stay with us now. God of love and compassion, you meet with us where we least expect to find you. Stay with us now. Stay with us in our frailty and in our difficulties. Stay with us on our journey. Take our hand and walk beside us. Live within us. Lead us to glory. Lead us home to you. And the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with us and remain with us this day and forevermore. Amen.